Case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. The final vote counts are in from the March 1st primary. None of the local races changed from what we saw on election night, but we have learned that in a way, some 1900 Bear County voters lost. Their votes ultimately were not counted. They voted by mail. This has to do with Texas's newly enacted voting law, Senate Bill 1, which resulted in a large number of rejections over technicalities. Gary Berger talked to the county's election administrator about what happened. To start, 1,900 is the minimum number of voters whose mail-in ballots were rejected. That's already unusually high. No, we, we've never seen it in those numbers. Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callinan said the Elections Department does not have a final tally of rejected ballots or a breakdown by party yet, though in general, Democrats had more mail-in ballots. The big issue with rejections has to do with a new requirement under the Republican-driven voting law, Senate Bill 1. Mail ballot envelopes now need to have the voter's state ID number or the last four of their social on the outside of the envelope in this spot under the flap. It's a spot some missed entirely. Because the design of the envelope is tough. The print is very small by the time they had to put all the legalese on the form. And writing down the wrong number, for example, putting their driver's license when they were registered under their social security would also prompt a rejection. So I would love to do nothing better but change that or to and and give us both so that we stand a better chance. Callan says the county tried to reach out to voters whose ballots were initially rejected using phone, email, and letters. Those voters then had six days from the election to try to fix the issue. That deadline passed at 5 p.m. Monday. Callan said election officials are going to try to see what they can do to smooth out this issue and make sure it doesn't happen again. That's especially important as we have two elections coming up quickly, both of them in May. Live at the Elections Department, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Garrett. Another big story we are covering this evening, a five-year-old boy missing in Bandera County for about 17 hours is back home and safe tonight. The boy was reported missing around 6.30 yesterday evening after going for a walk with his dog. More than 100 volunteers answered the call to help look for little Cameron. After spending a cold night alone, Cameron was found just before noon walking in a field today, spotted by that DPS helicopter. That chopper landed, picked him up, and took him to his family. So I said, did you see us? Did you hear us yelling? And he said, yes, <laughs> he did. And he said, and he waved him down. We thank God. We thank everybody that was here. The boy was dehydrated and had hypothermia. He was taken to a hospital to be checked out, but he's expected to be okay. Back here at home, San Antonio police making an arrest uh, the, uh, in a, a murder of a woman who was killed three years ago. 36-year-old Rogelio Mojica was arrested yesterday. He has been charged with murder in connection with the deadly shooting of 37-year-old Annette Juarez back in March of 2019. According to investigators, Mujica shot her, then abandoned her vehicle along Highway 90 on the west side. Police say the pair had an on-again, off-again relationship, and he had a history of family violence. Investigators used ballistics information and surveillance video to co connect Mujica to the crime, according to the arrest report. His bond set at $500,000. San Antonio police looking for suspects in a shooting after finding a man shot in the back downtown early this morning. This happened around 2.30 near East Houston and the Alamo. Investigators don't have much information to work with here, but we're told the man was found lying in the middle of the street. He was taken to a hospital with what were believed to be non-life-threatening injuries. So far, no word on any possible suspects. New information now in connection with a deadly crash on the southwest side from early yesterday morning. The man killed in that crash has now been identified as 21-year-old Isaiah Felix Velasquez. Velasquez died after police say he slammed his SUV into the back of an 18-wheeler that had pulled over to the side of Loop 410 near the Pearsall Road exit. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the semi not hurt. The cause of that crash still under investigation. New at six, it is the first local survey of its kind created by teenagers for teenagers. The questionnaire about mental health issues was released today for teens ages 12 to 19. As Courtney Friedman explains, it covers an array of tough topics that will help community youth leaders improve mental health care in San Antonio. 
This is no ordinary group of teenagers. These young adults are actively working to change the way our community views and handles mental health. Mental health is an issue affecting a lot of people our age. It's a chronic problem and most of us are not getting the help we actually need. Michael Martinez addressed the public today at a press conference explaining why the San Antonio Youth Commission and Metro Health's Project Worth created a survey for other teens about the mental health issues they face. We will continue to see this same issue getting worse. The 27 question survey was released today. It asks important questions about stress, depression, even drug use and self-harm. I think it's necessary to ask the tough questions in a gentle way that doesn't trigger so that we can get a deep understanding of the level of mental health challenges that we're seeing. Department of Human Services Director Melody Woosley says the survey is completely anonymous and every question gives teens the opportunity to say, I prefer not to answer that. The Youth Commission and the ambassadors, they will take the results of this and make recommendations on what initiatives or what services the community needs. We can advocate for more effective ways to expand our support network and the support we want at this age. The city of San Antonio is helping distribute the survey to schools, churches, and other organizations that deal with youth. The surveys must be completed by April 8th. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. 100 women becoming the newest American citizens today, all part of a naturalization tour that stopped by San Antonio. The tour organized by the National Partnership for New Americans. The goal of the tour is a nationwide effort to help naturalize 2 million people by 2022. The women were even sworn in by a female judge to really solidify the moment. Organizers say today's event was timed perfectly. And it also happens to be International Women's Day. So we are here celebrating this 100 women and we we'll, also want to encourage other legal residents that if they're eligible to go um, to get citizenship, that they go ahead and apply. Texas has the third largest number of permanent residents eligible for naturalization at 990,000. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. Let's go to the TransGuide camera here. 410 at Cherry Ridge looking back towards the west there. You can see traffic is snarled down to two lanes. Those inside lanes blocked there by what we believe to be a stalled vehicle. You can see a tow truck there on the scene, a couple of police vehicles as well, uh, causing traffic to have to merge over and, and crunch down into those two lanes. So just something to keep in mind. A bit of a slowdown at 410 and Cherry Ridge. Let's take a look at COVID-19 numbers in Bear County. Today, Metro Health reporting 123 new cases. Four more people have died. Meanwhile, 220 COVID positive patients are in local hospitals. 48 people, uh, 48 people, 84, I believe, in the ICU, excuse me, 41 people on ventilators. Meanwhile, COVID cases are down, but Metro Health says flu cases are creeping up here in the San Antonio area. And if you've come down with the virus, there's a reason your symptoms feel more intense than usual. As Stephanie Jimenez reports, it's something else we can all blame on COVID. And I've been careful and I've been masked and I live alone. For the past two years, Nina Eckstein has done everything possible to protect herself from COVID, avoiding large groups, masking up indoors, and it's worked. She never got the virus. Same thing with John Von Dolan, although he's been exceptionally virus free. I haven't really gotten a, the flu or a cold or anything in the past two years either. In Texas, flu cases usually peak in January or February, but that can change because the state's health department says that cases have peaked as early as October and as late as March. But there are several different factors that can affect the timing. Uh, normally, this time of year, uh, we're kind of at the end or uh, certainly on the downswing for influenza season. Uh, we've actually seen an increase uh, in influenza cases that are laboratory confirmed here since about mid-February, and, and it's still going up. Dr. Brian Alsip, chief medical officer at University Health, is especially concerned about that because now more people are holding gatherings and fewer people are wearing masks, making them more vulnerable. And let's say if you skipped a cold for a year or two or certainly skipped uh, it for you know a, at least a year, uh, maybe you have a little less of that uh, natural immunity than you might have had before, which means your body's all of a sudden being presented with a new pathogen, ramps up your immune system to fight it off, and you probably feel that effect uh, more than you might have before. 
Dr. Alsip says that doesn't mean you should avoid safety measures. He recommends following the same safety protocols like masking up for a little while longer until flu cases wane. Stefania Jimenez, KSAT 12 News. I want to correct some of the COVID-19 numbers we gave right before that story. There were currently 48 people in the ICU and 36 people on ventilators in our community. Meanwhile, beautiful shot outside downtown San Antonio. The sun came back today, Katie. Yes, great to see it. Clearing started a little bit sooner than we expected, but hey, we will take it. And we've got more sun on the way the next couple of days, but we're not done with cold air just yet. Our temperature roller coaster will continue for a few more days, and we'll talk about that shortly. The aquifer today is up half a foot to 658 and a half in another very long list of allergens. Seven reported today. Thankfully, everything, including oak, is nice and low. Our almanac today for San Antonio, 43 the morning low up to 60 with that clearing late this afternoon. But temperatures are already dropping back into the upper 50s and temperatures will fall through the 50s into the 40s this evening under mostly clear skies with a little bit of a breeze. A few uh, a small portion of the area could see a freeze tonight. We've still got the more widespread freeze in a few days. All that and more coming up in your full forecast. All right, thanks, Katie. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention making some changes to developmental milestones for children when they should hit those. Why that is causing concern next at six. Coming up tonight on the night beat, several children dead, their parents placed in handcuffs. Tonight, Metro Health hoping to save lives with a free class. The life lessons being laid out and what caretakers are saying after taking this course. Plus, gun violence and gun related deaths are on the rise, not just here in the city of San Antonio, but countywide. The Bear County Sheriff tells us it's all linked to one issue. Meanwhile, in the University Hospital emergency room, they're feeling the effects. I'll have that story coming up on the night beat. New at six, some changes to developmental milestone checklists for children under five. That has some health professionals and even some parents concerned. This is the first time the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has updated that list since it was released back in 2004. It actually delays the timeline when kids should be doing things like crawling, talking, even walking. Alicia Barrera spoke to some professionals who explain these changes and what it means for parents. It's a moment most parents long for. He said, Mama. But this time around, Shanda Rhodes had to wait longer than usual to hear her youngest son, Lincoln, speak. At like 18 months old, 19 months old, he was still at, like doing things like an eight month old. Cases of delayed developmental milestones among children have increased during the pandemic. And while the CDC's latest change isn't an effort to help parents identify these delays more quickly, Health professionals fear it could have the opposite effect of more children falling behind. The CDC is now saying that at 30 months, um, children should have about 50 words. Now, our data, our research, our charts that we follow, we see an average of about 400 words. Lindsay Cardenas is a speech language pathologist for Assessment Intervention Management, or AIM. Our biggest fear is that with the changes, people are going to say, oh, well, I don't have to worry just yet. But research shows a correlation between language and academic success. When you do think something is concerning, something is off, ask questions. Ask questions to your pediatrician. In the case of speech pathology professionals, the CDC's recommendations will not change their approach. Pediatric physical therapists are also showing concern after the CDC no longer lists crawling as a milestone. And when it comes to walking, the CDC says that if the child isn't walking by 18 months versus the original 12, parents shouldn't be worried. You can head over to KSAT.com for that full conversation with a physical therapist from Baptist Health. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Take another live look outside with Sky 12, continuing our spring break week tour of things to do high over the San Antonio Zoo. Always a popular place on spring break. Oh, yeah, and of course it turned out to be a beautiful day for it. It started out nice and gray, but things turned around, Katie. Yes, and we're going to see a couple of much nicer days Wednesday and Thursday. So if the zoo was in your plans this week, you will have much more enjoyable weather. The next couple of days, Friday, 
that's a different story. Friday is when things turn cold once again, so still plenty to pay attention to in the forecast. Let's start off with a look at today's uh, rainfall estimates. We had some showers and even a couple little thunderstorms east of 35, generally between Gonzales and the Houston area early in the day. Places like College Station got a good drink of water there, a bit more than a half inch of rain, but places like Victoria, three one hundredths of an inch, also just two one hundredths of an inch of rain in New Braunfels. Um, and unfortunately, that really wasn't anything for us didn't help us out at all. And even that rain that fell though really didn't fall where it was most needed. Where we really need it the most is where we have a swath of extreme drought from south of Eagle Pass all the way over into a portion of Live Oak and either even southern Atascosa County. But essentially the whole KSAT viewing area with the exception of this sliver of I-35 up to Austin. Essentially the whole area really could use some good rainfall. Unfortunately, our rainfall outlook over the next few days continues to be be very bleak. We will have another low in chance of some showers Friday with the arrival of our next big cold front. This is a beautiful shot on live cam. We've got some lingering mid level and high clouds in the distance there, but uh, the clearing has been really nice and it allowed temperatures in some spots to pop into the 60s this afternoon. 63 in Hondo right now, 57 in San Antonio, 60 in Pleasanton, still a bit cooler from the Grange down to Victoria and Beeville where the cloud cover hung on a bit longer, but it does look like clouds are really starting to clear out uh, to the east even as we speak this evening. As we head through the overnight hours, we'll see maybe a few more mid and high level clouds try to filter in from the southwest. But um, with the clearing that we've seen take place this afternoon and this evening, it will get cold overnight. Essentially, the whole area will be dropping into the 30s, but only a portion of the area is expected to drop to the freezing mark and maybe even a couple degrees below. So friends in the Hill Country, Lost Maples, Tarpley, Bernie Stage, up to Canyon Lake, we are expecting you to drop down to 32, 31, even 30 degrees. So low 30s, a light freeze overnight. Everyone else, San Antonio, Bear County, Randolph, Floresville, Divine, you're expected to stay a few degrees above freezing. It will be cold, but the only freeze we anticipate tonight will be across the hill country. Now, if you've been watching the past couple days, you know we've been talking about a more widespread late season freeze that is still in the cards, but not until Friday night into the upcoming weekend. So let's take a quick look at that setup. Air is still frigid over Canada and this cold air mass will start to drop south over the next couple of days, but we will get a break in the chilly air here tomorrow. 64 year high temperature Thursday 74, a much more spring like day. And just when you think we're getting back into the warmth Friday morning, 6 to 9 a.m. We expect this front to start to move through San Antonio, so this will be an early day cold front. There will be a low in chance for some showers, but again, big impacts with the wind, very strong north winds again Friday and a very cold air mass moving in. This sets us up for the more widespread late season freeze Friday night into Saturday morning also potentially Saturday night um, into uh, into Sunday morning. So this is what we're looking at here. Roughly the Highway 90 corridor and points north. That's where a freeze is likely area south of that. You'll likely be in the 30s, but it will be really close. We'll continue to watch the temperature trends, and as Friday night gets closer, we'll be able to really hone in on specific temperature forecasts for you. But um, that more widespread freeze is still in the forecast. Tomorrow, a cold start, very nice day overall. Another warm day on Thursday, then cold and windy Friday. Weekends, the mornings will be cold, but our afternoons, not too bad with a good amount of sun Saturday and Sunday, guys. All right, looks good. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. Probably safe to assume when Pop breaks that NBA win record, we won't see balloons and confetti <laughs> raining down from the AT&T Center. <laughs> Count on it. And his legacy actually carries over for guys like Bruce Bowen, who's now a head coach himself in high school. When we come back, what has Bruce learned from Pop in his coaching debut, if you will? And rebuilding or reloading? That's the question right now put to the UTSA Roadrunners coming up. Thursday comes Greg Pop.
Popovich can make NBA history as early as tomorrow night with a win against the Toronto Raptors in the AT&T Center. That's after he's able to tie his former Boston mentor, Don Nelson, with his 1,335th victory last night in the 117-110 win over the Lakers in an unprecedented 26 seasons with the Spurs. Now the five-time NBA champion can break that record with his next victory with six games left in this homestand. Pop has been at the helm and the Spurs since December of 1996 on the very day David Robinson returned from an injury to rejoin the Silver and Black in Phoenix. In fact, during a timeout last night, Pop strolled across the court to visit with 5-0 and his son David in the second row, presumably to ask the Admiral to suit up since the Spurs are playing shorthanded last night. But don't look for any massive post-game celebration. If he does, that's just not the Pop way. It's great to be, you know, this is a tiny part of Coach Pop's uh, record, record set and win. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can go get the record the next in the next game and, uh, you know, keep it going, keep pushing it. All right, and here's a look at that matchup for that next game. Toronto in town tomorrow at 7.30. The TMI boys basketball team has come up just short of the TAPS 5A state title this past Saturday, falling to McKinney Christian 56-51 in double overtime in the championship game at West High School in Waco. This was head coach Bruce Bowen's first season at the helm there, and he helped set the tone for the Panthers moving forward. Bowen, of course, won three NBA championships with San Antonio in 2003, 05, and 07, and he said he learned a lot from coaching Pop, watching Pop coach the Spurs. What I saw in Pop was that he let us go out and play. You can only do so much, and you've got to trust the kids and trust that they're prepared. And if you're not feeling that trust, then you're not doing your part. So it is a little different on this side, but at the same time, I understand that the kids look at me to be able to, say, handle situations. If I'm frantic and, and I lose my head, then they're going to lose their heads. So I have a responsibility to them to make sure that I do what I'm supposed to do as well. All right, Bowen's son Ohani led the Panthers 17 points as one of eight players who will return to TMI next season. The UTSA Roadrunners continue their spring workouts with day two on campus, getting ready for the 2022 season. That opens with three huge opponents, Houston at home, and then back-to-back -back road games to Army and Texas in Austin. This will be Jeff Trader's third season as a head coach of the Roadrunners, who saw major improvements from his first season in the middle of COVID with seven wins in a jumbled season to a school record 12, se 12 wins last season, including the first-ever Conference USA Championship. The Roadrunners have lost some pretty good players from last year's championship teams, such as Sincere McCormick, Spencer Burford, and Tariq Woolen to name a few. I can't tell you how many guys today in stretch line, I looked them right in the eye and said, this is a very, very important spring for you. So we're excited about that task of, of rebuilding this team and uh, to see what the future holds for us. And the UTSA runners kick off their season at home against Houston on September the 3rd. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. And with the NFL season set to open on March the 16th, just over a week from today, there are reports of both the Washington Commanders and the Carolina Panthers are interested in trading for Deshaun Watson. I have no idea why they would do that because of all the legal issues he's facing, not to mention a criminal investigation and also a possible suspension by the NFL. Why would you risk a trade with first round draft picks involved for that right now? A lot of baggage there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. Nine out of ten people living with the condition don't know that they even have chronic kidney disease. That is a statistic from the National Institutes of Health. And March is Kidney Awareness Month, so we're going to do that. We're going to talk about awareness and the things that we all need to know. We're going to bring in Tiffany Jones-Smith with the Texas Kidney Foundation for our Q&A today. Tiffany, thank you for being here. Um, there's a lot of education that needs to be done when it comes to kidney disease. So let's start there. When we say kidney kidney disease. What is that? What does that mean? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. And uh, chronic kidney disease is when your kidneys are not uh, functioning properly. Your kidneys uh, clean toxins from your body. Um, and so when they're not not cleaning toxins properly, uh, that's chronic kidney disease. Unlike other diseases, Tiffany, uh, kidney disease is one that you might not even know that you have. She just mentioned that st statistic right off the bat. So mm -hmm. what can people be watching for? What are some of the risk factors and warning signs folks need to be aware of? Well, kidney disease, the reason why um, kidney disease is dubbed the silent killer is because it doesn't show ready risk factors immediately. So the way that you find out whether or not you have kidney disease is by having your blood and urine tested. 
Is there anything that people can do to lessen their risk? Um, well, the, the two leading factors for kidney disease are diabetes and hypertension. Um, so eating better, uh, living better, those, those are ways that you can make tweaks to your diet and, and make a big change in, uh, in your risk factors for kidney disease. A 10% change in your BMI, and, and uh, it, it's a life-changing experience. Certainly San Antonio has its issues with diabetes and other chronic health issues. How does San Antonio and Bear County stack up with the rest of the country and the rest of the state when it comes to kidney disease? Well, Bear County has a, a high incidence of uh, kidney disease, and it's related to diabetes. So um, Texas houses 10% of the kidney disease population in the United States. So it's a, a, a big problem here. And we actually have something in place to address that here in Bear County, a huge public health initiative. Talk to us about that and what in, what's entailed in that and the significance of the size of this program. Yes, let's talk about it. <laughs> it's called uh, Silent but deadly, because kidney disease is silent but deadly. It is a disease that goes largely uh, unnoticed, but it is devastating to those who end up with kidney disease. Uh, the reason why we started it is because uh, we know that early identification is the best way to slow down and stop the progression of kidney disease. The sooner you find it, the more you can do to maintain your quality of life. You mentioned testing was a way the, to figure out whether or not uh, you might be susceptible to this. Who should be getting tested and if how frequently? If you were diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension, if you have cardiovascular disease, or if you are obese, you should get tested for chronic kidney disease. Is that something and you should do annually or how often, is it just one test and you know? You should do it annually. Um, and you want to test the blood and the urine, preferably. Um, w we have the largest public health initiative that's ever been done in a single county um, happening here in Bear County. We're testing 8,000 people uh, for chronic kidney disease with uh, an at-home kit called uh, our Kidney Check. And it was given to us by this wonderful company called Healthy IO. Uh, and it's simple pimple. All you, you do is pee in your cup, put your dipstick in, put it on the green, uh, put your dipstick stick on the green board, put your phone over the, the green board, and it will uh, give you the results at home and us the results at Texas Kidney Foundation. I'm glad you mentioned the at-home testing. I know we have done stories uh, about the availability of those tests. So is mm -hmm. that something that people can really rely on? Are those easily accessible? It's something that they can rely on. They are easily accessible. You just go to www.txkidney.org and you can uh, take your, your test and uh, it, it, you answer 12 questions and we send the at-home kit to you. So yes, it takes about two weeks for the kits to get to you. And uh, as soon as it gets there, you can take the test. And then what are some of the risks if you don't take care of this once you find out that you might have some issues and, and you don't take care of it? What are some of the problems people are looking at long term if you don't deal with this? Well, the worst thing that we're looking at long term, long term would be uh, end stage renal disease. And right now, uh, end stage renal disease is uh, the only therapeutic we have for it. We have two, two possibilities, a therapeutic, which is dialysis, and everybody knows uh, what dialysis is. In, in the city of San Antonio, uh, we have over 50 dialysis clinics. And uh, so dialysis is all around us. So this month is Kidney Awareness Month, but then on Thursday, World Kidney Day. So lots of opportunities to learn more about this disease and raise that awareness. Yes, lots of opportunities to learn more. And uh, Texas Kidney Foundation, uh, as you know, I've lost uh, 12 family members to chronic kidney disease. So oh my goodness. I understand what 
the cliff that people are being pushed off. And Texas Kidney Foundation, we are committed to it. We, if you're being pushed off that cliff, buddy, we're we're willing to jump and free fall with you to help you land softly. We know what early detection is the first step, but we have a comprehensive program uh, connected to what you can do next steps wise in terms of of your kidney health uh and and our wonderful partners texas diabetes institute i mean those guys they are the best of the best terry de la haya is uh she is a community hero and uh really whenever we're doing stuff on uh, minority health month and that kind of thing we need to be talking to that lady because <laughs> she's amazing. <laughs> so this work um, that you do, obviously very personal for you. Uh, certainly there's a passion behind it. So Tiffany Jones Smith with the Texas Kidney Foundation. Thanks for being here to educate all of us and uh, good luck with the events that are happening this month as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. We'll be right back. Here's a question for you. Did your muscles take a break during the pandemic? COVID forced many people to take time off from the gym, but how much did our muscles suffer? Ursula Perry now with new research that shows your muscles have memories. If you have to put your workouts on pause, you might worry that you'll lose your fitness gains. Well, luckily there's something called muscle memory. As long as you stay active, you're creating muscle memory. You're in the process of that. Here's how it works. Every time you work out, you build a foundation of strength and endurance. So your muscles literally remember what they're supposed to do. If I ran a mile and I'm used to running a mile and I stop running a mile for a while and I begin to start running a mile, there's a chance that I will adapt to that much faster than never having run a, a mile. A new study conducted in mice suggests that you build muscle memory no matter how long it's been since you've hit the gym. Researchers found that animals that participated in weighted wheel workouts were able to add more muscle more quickly when they retrained after 12 weeks of inactivity, as compared to the mice that never trained. That 12 weeks is about 10% of the lifespan of a mouse. Scientists say these studies suggest that human muscles should remain primed in response to the exercises when they start again, even years later and all you're doing is recall on it. If you took a break from the gym, remember you're still gonna have to warm back up to a regular routine. And here's another tip, if you're not going back to the gym yet, according to a study, if you increase your protein intake while not working out, you might be able to maintain your lean muscle mass that you earned when you were. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam, 55 degrees. That chill was with us today, but we got some good sunshine, at least for a little bit, Katie. At least for a little bit, and we should see plenty of sun the next two days. But as we start to warm back up again, as we get to Thursday, temperatures are in the 70s. Uh, don't be fooled. Remember, we've got another strong cold front coming in to finish up the work week. More on that shortly. First, another look at our almanac today. 43 our morning low up to 60 this afternoon. That's 12 degrees cooler than our average high for this time of year. So certainly a little chilly temperatures are falling through the 50s now. Mostly clear skies and a little bit of a breeze. We'll take a look at your forecast morning lows tomorrow. Hill country, you could see a light freeze. A look at that in Friday's front coming up. Not the greatest weather to kick off spring break, but perhaps that afternoon sun enticed some people to get out of the house with the kids today. Yeah, it was something. I hope so. Yeah, uh, improvement today and the next couple of days are going to be really nice. It's going to feel a lot more like spring break, especially by Thursday. But then we'll get cold once again. So we promised you a temperature roller coaster this week for spring break and uh, it's working out that way. That's for sure. Let's look at morning lows for the rest of the week. Our average low this time of year is right around 50 and uh, compared to that, we're going to really be all over the board. Mid 30s tomorrow morning, 
Then a little warmer through Thursday morning, Friday morning, 55. That'll be right before the cold front gets here. And then by the weekend, that's when we expect a more widespread late season freeze across south central Texas. So again, that's still in the cards for this weekend, but we do have a portion of the area that could drop down into the low 30s early tomorrow morning, and that's going to be the hill country. So just a different vantage point for you here. Uh, Canyon Lake, Bulverde, Bernie stage. We are expecting you guys to get down to 31, 32, and then farther to the northwest across more of the hill country. Low temperatures are expected to settle in the low 30s there. So this will be a light freeze for portions of the hill country. Everyone else, Holotus, Rio Medina, Uvalde, Pleasanton, it will still be cold overnight, but we do expect low temperatures to land in the upper 30s, mid to upper 30s for everyone else with the exception of the hill country. Now this freeze tonight for the hill country is not terribly odd because the average last freeze dates across places like Rock Springs, Kerrville up to Fredericksburg. Um, it is in mid to late March, so a freeze tonight for our friends up to the northwest. Not terribly uncommon. San Antonio's average last freeze is February 24th, so we're several weeks past that date, so a freeze this weekend. That'll be a good bit past the average last freeze date here around San Antonio and Bear County. But as we've been reminding you, we have had a freeze as late as early April. Can't promise that that's in the cards this year, um, but to see a, a freeze uh, in March, it's just something we've always got to keep an eye out on. That's for sure. High temperatures today are average here in San Antonio 72. We only made it up to 60 thanks to the clouds, but notice west of 35. Cloud cover broke up there sooner, so it was able to warm up to just shy of 70 in Catula and almost up to 70 in Del Rio. Currently sitting at 67 in Del Rio, 57 in Pleasanton and 54 in Kerrville. Cloud cover has really cleared out now. Even areas east of 35 that were holding on to that cloud cover um, a bit more over the past couple of hours. All that will continue to move east. I can't rule out some mid and high level clouds filtering in overnight through early tomorrow morning, but overall we're kickstarting a couple day trend here with a lot more sunshine. We'll see plenty of sunshine Wednesday that will continue into Thursday. Maybe just a few fair weather clouds here or there, but overall nice and warm as we get into Thursday and then cold front gets here Friday morning. ETA for San Antonio right now is roughly between about 6 and 9 a.m. Give us another day or two and we'll be able to, you know, make that window a bit more specific, but this will be an early day cold front for us. This will come through with a strong north wind and also another chance for some isolated showers, mainly through the first part of the day on Friday, um, and then our rain chances will drop off, but we're likely going to stay overcast Friday, strong north winds and temperatures falling to right around 40 Friday afternoon. So I expect we'll start off 55. Friday morning and then land right around 40 Friday afternoon. So kind of an upside down day gray and very windy. North winds could gust up to 40 45 miles per hour on Friday. So another little taste of winter here as we wrap up the week. Now this weekend with that cold air mass, that's the more widespread freeze, but our afternoons really won't be too bad. We'll see plenty of sun this weekend and by early next week. Highs will be back closer to 80 guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning. It is Tuesday the 8th. An overnight shooting that happened in the downtown area happened this morning just after 2.30 on Avenue E near East Houston Street and the Alamo. Right now, investigators don't have much to go on, but we're told the victim's a man in his 20s. He was in found in the middle of the street with a gunshot wound to the back. He was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. So we're at the corner of San Pedro and Elmira. You can see behind me a couple of gas stations. You saw kind of a big jump here, anywhere from 369 to 389. I'm going to jump out of the way and show you some of these prices here at this quick trip right here on San Pedro. So AAA reporting this morning that the average price for regular gas in San Antonio is actually three. 375 and a month ago it was three dollars while a driver in the hospital tonight after he crashed into a highway pillar overnight now san antonio police trying to figure out what caused that crash they say the impact caused the man to hit the windshield giving him a serious head injury no one else was involved
Good afternoon, and look at this. Good news coming in from Bandera County. All right, we have Sky 12 video of the results of what was a search for a missing boy in Bandera County. As you can see, he is safe. Hey guys, it was just around 1130 when we heard a lot of clapping and cheering as five-year-old Cameron was found by a DPS helicopter. This search went on for about 17 hours. He was reported missing yesterday yesterday around 630 when he was last seen on his family's property here in Bandera walking around with his dog. <gasps> All right, finally at six, a neighborhood in Houston seeing some unusual action when a pig decided to make a run for it. The nine month old pig named, of course, appropriately bacon got out and decided to check out the surrounding houses and yards. One of the neighbors used some crackers to keep bacon occupied until animal control arrived. Apparently someone left a door open and well, bacon saw his chance and made a run for it. The owner of the hog could be looking for a ticket for having a pig in the city limits. No word yet if that little piggy went wee 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 <laughs> all the way home. Looks like he's pretty comfortable. Yeah. I mean, somebody saved the owner's bacon. I'd be a little worried about <laughs> having a name like bacon, but hey. <laughs> Should have ran faster. Kind of cute. And crackers did it, you know? <laughs> that's that's all he needed was just a few just ritz. Well, I can kind of relate. <laughs> you know, when you got a craving. A good ritz cracker ran. I'll do it. Okay, I don't know how we segue from that to the weather. There's a lot going on here still over the next several days. Strong front Friday morning turns things cold again and then a freeze likely across a bigger portion of the area this weekend, guys. Somebody who works in print asked me if TV people just come up with these puns. Like, is that no. part of our training? No, <laughs> it just happens.